Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really good to see you. If, it's a good job that you're all wearing your masks, and thank you for wearing your masks. Um, if, if you weren't, you would be detecting a strange smell this morning, which would be the stench of hypocrisy. Um, as Mastona was telling us in the notices, uh, the search team, we've been listening to uh, lots of sermons, 17 people, at least one sermon each. And then we spent two or three hours Thursday evening saying, well, this sermon was good, this sermon could have been better, this sermon, mm, not so sure about that. And then Friday, I sat down and wrote mine. Um, so it was uh, more nerve-wracking than usual. And you may have heard my stunner just say, oh, no. That's because she's anticipated what I'm about to say, which is, she said, you know, with this, this pastor... I didn't feel pierced to my heart. So there's been no pressure at all. No pressure. Um, now, the last time I had the privilege of, of uh, speaking to you, um, I took as the basis for my sermon uh, some songs by Bob Dylan, if you were here, you'll remember. And some of you will be relieved to know that that's not the case today. Today, it's time to move on to that award-winning Canadian hip-hop duo, The Dream Warriors, and their first two singles, Wash Your Face in My Sink, and My Definition of a Boombastic Jazz Sound. I'm joking, actually. I, I think even I would struggle to make that a sermon. That was just to make sure if you hadn't, you hadn't switched off already. Um, now, if you've read the newsletter, and I encourage you to, the, the email that comes around, if you don't get it, then uh, write to icprague.cz, CZ if you're American, and a uh, request to be put on the mailing list. And um, you'll see that the title for today is uh, The Problem with Psalm 51. Uh, I have a problem with Psalm 51, which is strange because in many ways Psalm 51 is a heartfelt cry which I can associate with. It's the cry of a sinful man. But anyway, I have a problem with Psalm 51. But before we turn to Psalm 51, we'll turn to Scripture. If you want to turn to it in your Bibles, and your phones, uh, please do. We're going to, uh, to Samuel, chapter 11. And if you want, you can follow it on the screen. Book of 2 Samuel and chapter 11. Starting at verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, I'm sure there's a sermon there. You know, we talk about spring's the time when the buds come out and the flowers bloom and you know, the days start getting longer. No, it's the time when kings go off to war. David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And there's another sermon there. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman washing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from un monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Then we skip forward a little bit to verse 14. Bath David has tried to get Uriah. He's called him home from battle and tried to get him to sleep with Bathsheba. But Uriah is just too honourable for that. So in the morning, verse 14, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. Which is what happens. And in verse 26 we read this. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead... She mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. 
But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There are two men in a certain town, one rich, one poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why? Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down, you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Verse 13, we read this. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You don't say. This is one of the, the most disreputable things that we find in the Old Testament, especially from a, a leader, a man who is lauded as godly, a man after God's own heart. It's so serious, this kind of behavior, that I think even in 2021, if a politician or a leader behaved in this way, they might actually have to resign. It's a rare thing these days. But for David, this is a calamity. He'd faced down Goliath, trusting in God and trusting in his own God-given skills. He had carried himself honorably when serving Saul, even though he'd already been anointed by Samuel. He'd trusted God to work in his own time and to do everything that was necessary to fulfill his promise that he would be king. He was hero worshipped by the people. One of the reasons Saul tried to have David killed was when they came home from battle, the, all the people were going, yeah, Saul has killed his thousands and David's killed his tens of thousands. And it burned for Saul. He hated him. But this was David, a man after God's own heart. He was the man who had everything. As Nathan explained to him, as we've just read, God said, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you a master's house to you and your master's wives. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you more. Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh the provider, we've been singing about this morning. I gave you all these things, I would have given you more. But for David, it wasn't enough. Surveying from his palace roof, with deep irony, the capital city of the nation he ruled, which God had given to him, he saw something, someone, that he didn't have, and he wanted her. Now, in today's climate of victim blaming, Bathsheba would possibly have been advised not to bathe on her rooftop. But you'll notice no blame is attached to her. The fault 
lies with David, with what he did, with what he saw. And so that whole sorry tale unfolds and leads ultimately to Uriah's murder. And I wonder, human nature being what it is, I wonder if at that point, when he got news that Uriah was killed, I wonder if he thought, I've got away with it. I'm sure it had troubled him. But I think maybe he felt that it was in the past. I'm sure we all have sins and indiscretions that we are relieved never became public. Major, minor, sometimes we can relate to... Now, this is going to date you if you recognise this character on the screen. You're probably of a certain age. Dick Dastardly. Who remembers Dick Dastardly? Oh, yes. So it's a culturally irrelevant reference for most of you. I'm sorry about that. Um, Go and watch The Wacky Races. You won't go wrong. David thinks he's got away with it. But he hasn't. Nathan, I can imagine him saying, really, Lord? You really want me to say this? He delivers a real gotcha of a morality tale to David. And David, is, he's sunk. If he, were twen- if he were a 21st century politician, he would probably have said, sins have been committed against the Lord. Mistakes were made. With the benefit of hindsight, I would not have risked everything to commit adultery, even to the point of murdering an honourable and brave man to hide my sin. But hindsight is always twenty twenty. But at last, too late, for, too late for Uriah, but at last, David does do the honourable thing. He confesses his guilt. And that's where Psalm 51 comes in. Now the pessimists among you are looking at your watches and you're thinking, whoa, that's the introduction? (laughs) Go on, admit it. You're waiting for me to get Psalm 51 and you're right to worry. No, I I don't think you are. Um, We'll see. But Psalm 51 comes in because David, pierced by, in effect, confronting himself with his guilt, having been shown it by Nathan, He writes Psalm 51. Just in case you thought Bob Dylan was going to be left out completely, in his song I and I, he describes David as a righteous king who wrote psalms beside moonlight streams. That's not the picture that Psalm 51 conjures up. This is a cry of the heart. This is a tortured cry. It's in such stark contrast to the arrogance of his treatment of Uriah. Notice when he sends the letter, which is in effect Uriah's death warrant, he sends it with Uriah. He could not have been colder or more calculating. He could not have been more arrogant and apparently feeling invulnerable that he can do whatever he wants. But this is a cry of the heart. And you might be thinking, well, what could possibly be wrong with this beautiful song? Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my, transgre- my transgressions wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. David acknowledges his sin. He proclaims his guilt. He knows he has to rely completely on God's mercy to survive. He knows 
what the true response is that God wants from his people. So where's the problem? Well, it's here in verse 4. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now forgive me. I can almost see Uriah and Bathsheba and Bathsheba's dead son doing a bit of a double take at this. What? If I were Uriah, I might take exception to that. Having committed adultery with my wife, you then try to trick me into sleeping with her while you lounge about in your palace. And then when that fails, you have me killed and you cost the lives of other soldiers all so that your sin gets covered up. And it's against God and God only that you have sinned. Well, excuse me. In fact, forget Uriah, Uriah, because in my heart... I take exception to that. I struggle with that. That's the problem with Psalm 51. But in a way, it's a beautiful problem. Because what it reveals to us is how radical the biblical worldview of life is. It reminds us that biblical Christianity, it's not a club, it's not a religion, it's not a social movement or a political movement. It's a faith which obliges us, if we take it seriously, to question everything we know or assume we know and to understand it through God's eyes as revealed through scripture. Something that's not wrong with Psalm 51 is that in effect, It presents the gospel to us. First of all, and there's a long list coming up which I couldn't work out in Proclaim how to get it to appear bullet by bullet, and then I forgot to ask Alex. Um, But it tells us that God is merciful, and you can't read it anyway, so that's fine. Ever-loving, compassionate, forgiving and cleansing, righteous, true in his judgments, demanding, a teacher of wisdom, a purifier, a punisher, a deliverer, a saviour, worthy of praise. That's quite a list. It's not a very long psalm, but that's quite a list. And what that does is it tells us that God is so beyond anything we can imagine. He's so beyond our miserable little lives, miserable in comparison with him. He's so beyond our sinfulness. He's so beyond this world that he created. He's, you know, he's almighty, he's holy, he's righteous. He's all of these things. And when we begin to understand how far removed from him we are, then we start to understand verse 4 of Psalm 51. Because we are, as you can see, as represented by David, transgressors, people who cross the line. We're iniquitous. We're sinful. We're evildoers. We're crushed. So here we have in this psalm, this gulf, this chasm between who God is and what he is like and who we are and what we are like. And it's, you know, it can't be bridged. It's not like if we, if we do 10,000 10, hours practice, we'll get perfect at being human. That's not going to happen. We can't watch inspirational videos and work out how to do it. The gulf is insurmountable. But the good news also in this psalm, in God, we can be loved. We can be cleansed. We can be faithful. We can be wise. 
can't count the number of times in the last few months we've prayed to be wise on the search team and in the elders. We can be joyful and glad. We can be pure of heart. We can be steadfast. We can be in God's presence. We can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. We can be saved. We can be joyful. We can be willing and we can be sustained by God. God the provider. We can be evangelists. We can be a people of praise. We can be broken and contrite. And we can be accepted by God. And you have to think, well, hang on. This God from two slides ago, who is all those things and more, he can accept me? There's an interesting book I've, I've read recently. You might have read it, The Kite Runner, uh, by um, Khaled Hosseini. And in it, the narrator, Amir, his baba, his dad, says to him that in Islam there's only one true sin, and that's the sin of theft. And he says, when you kill a man, you steal a life, Baba said. You steal his wife's right to a husband, rob his children of a father. When you tell a lie, you steal someone's right to the truth. When you cheat, you steal the right to fairness. Do you see? The reason I thought of that is because wrestling with this problem of verse 4 of Psalm 51, this idea that sin is against God, is such a tricky one. But it just reminded me of that passage from the Kite Runner, because all sin is against God. Others might be hurt, in Uriah's case, killed. Others' lives might be made miserable. You, your actions might have life-changing consequences for others or for yourself. But the sin is against God. And I think this is important. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, Jesus tells the crowd, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And in verse 27, he says, You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, David. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And the point he's making here, I think, is that the sins of our hearts, the bitterness, the anger, the greed, the lust, the envy, these are all things that we might rationalise away with the thought that there is no victim. These are thoughts and feelings. No one gets hurt. If you annoy me today and I go home doing a muttly impersonation to keep going with the wacky races reference, who gets hurt? It's just in my head. And Jesus is saying, no, your sin is against me. It's not about how good we look to others. Psalm 51 and Jesus, they tell us that this is a deception that we play on ourselves. And I wonder sometimes how many young unmarried men and women have found themselves using an abortion clinic because the chances of a pregnancy being found out by their church is considerably less than if the young woman turns up visibly pregnant at the church and they know what they will face if they chose the more righteous course of action. We can't get it into our heads that our sin is against God, that our sin can be of, in our minds as much as our actions. David's sin, I think, was very public. 
But what he understood was, at its heart, every sin is against God. Because it's his perfect standards that we fall short of. And rather wonderfully, David also realises, he understands that salvation is through repentance and through God's forgiveness. And he has confidence that his sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart will not be rejected by God. So in this psalm, we actually have a beautiful expression of the gospel, like I said before. We have a perfect, holy God. We have sinful humankind. We have the acknowledgement of our unworthiness. We have acceptance by faith that God is more than capable of cleansing us from that sin. And finally, we have the forgiveness. And notice that forgiveness just doesn't end with, whew, I'm forgiven. It's forgiveness that spurs us on to telling others about this good news. Psalm 51 orients us in the proper direction. It gives the proper perspective. All our sin, seen and unseen, is against God. And it's he only who can forgive it, who can cleanse us. And while part of me still has a problem with Psalm 51, when I examine it and I understand it, when I read it carefully, that problem goes away because it's, it just points me in the right direction and it tells me the good news that God will not despise me or anyone who comes to him acknowledging our sin and our need of him, that we can't, you know, we can't fix it ourselves. We have to go to his son, our saviour. And that brings us to communion, which we're going to uh, celebrate today. Communion, of course, is the ultimate reminder of the sacrifice that Jesus made. His wasn't a broken heart, but a broken body. And that body, the bread reminds us, was broken for us. And his blood is the blood that washes us whiter than snow. The blood that's represented by the wine that we drink. You see how that's in Psalm 51? The good news. And there are two, th two reasons, two main reasons why we do this thing that we call communion. First, Jesus asked us to, commanded us to, and he asked us to do it in remembrance of him. Because um, we forget, don't we? We forget little things. I got up from the drum kit up during rehearsal and went into the cupboard to get something. By the time I got there, I had no idea what I went to get. Completely gone. But we forget important things. Anyone here ever forgotten a birthday? You don't have to be ashamed. I've forgotten birthdays. I actually spectacularly, along with my parents, forgot my own birthday one year. Um, <laughs> there was never going to be any hope. Um, we forget things. And so Jesus told us to do this. And he said, do it in, remem in, in remembrance of me. So that we don't forget. That we don't take it for granted. And we have to be careful that it doesn't become routine. And we just kind of go through the motions. This is a reminder of the cost of our salvation. That gulf between the holy, perfect, righteous God and the wretched sinner that I am could only be covered by the cross of Jesus. And it took his broken body and his shed blood to do that. And so that's why we do it, to remember him. And it's a declaration. You know, David said, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my saviour, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. 
It's a declaration. When we do this, we declare the Lord's death and his resurrection. And we take this time, this precious time, to remember him. So as the band come up, I'm going to play while we take communion. Uh, it's the usual COVID arrangements. We have four or five tables with the uh, elements on them. Um, once I've given thanks for it, then please go to the most convenient one. Try not to queue, get into gaggles. We're trying to be as safe as we can. Um, and then eat the bread and, and, and drink the, the wine and the juice in your own time, prayerfully, thoughtfully. Um, none of us is worthy of salvation except that God's love compelled him to give his son for us so we're worthy to take this and to remember him if we know him Jesus as our Lord and our Saviour if you're not in that place that's fine just stay stay where you are talk to us about it afterwards ask us why we're doing this kind of weird thing and we'll be happy to share with you the good news that this is something that you can take part in. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, these well-known verses, Paul, trying to kind of whip the Corinthian church into line and getting communion right, he says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever, Paul says, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, we proclaim, the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we, we truly believe that as we are gathered in your son's name, we are in the very presence of almighty creator God. And we know we're not worthy. We know, like David, that we have sinned, and we've sinned against you. And the gulf between us and our sinfulness and you and your holiness is too vast to understand. But we know and we thank you that you bridged that gap by sending us your son. You love us so much that you sent him to die for us. He became sin for us. He gave his life for us. And wonderfully, he rose again. He defeated death. He defeated sin. And in him, we can come into your presence. That curtain was torn that separated humankind from the most holy place. And we can enter into your presence and we can worship you and we can praise you. And we, we do this tiny but significant thing this morning as we take the bread and the wine. We cannot imagine the pain and the suffering, but we thank you that Jesus was willing to come and die for us. We can't imagine the joy and the celebration that will come when he comes again and we go to be in your presence for eternity. It's beyond our human comprehension, but we believe it and we look forward to it with great anticipation. You have taken us and you have made us holy in your sight through your son, Jesus Christ. And so we have this time now. We thank you. We worship you. We, we take this time to say that we love you, Lord. And we want to be your servants. And we ask all of these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.